wonderful to see a, uh, a full house again, and we really appreciate the attendance. I just want to say a few things. Um, got the microphones on. Um, one, you know, on, on Monday when I introduced our, our, our speaker, Amiante Dure, I, I, I talked a lot about the, the dedication of the college to the international and the John Park Young Fund, specifically in terms of funding many of these events, including uh, tonight's event. Um, but this, 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 this event, or this week's event, I should say, is also a celebration of, of 25 years of a very special program, uh, the, the OTSI at the UN program, which is a, a program that sent 350 students over the course of 25 years to really remarkable internships, where just in the last year, we had students representing the Honduras in the General Assembly when, when, when Obama was giving a talk. We had uh, Rebecca Stewart uh, negotiating on behalf of the United Kingdom, the third committee. We had the previous year a student uh, directing uh, PSAs uh, on behalf of the UN uh, and directing George Clooney and Chelsea Theron and, and, and other people like that. So really substantial internships that have, that have really, I think, been transformative experiences for 99.9% of the students who have been part of this, this program. And it's uh, clearly a, a crown jewel of Occidental College. It's clearly a crown jewel of, of, of the DUA program. Um, and it, this is really a, a week to celebrate that. And in 25 years of a remarkable program, it doesn't have its parallel in any other college in the United States. And specifically, there, there, there are two people I want to acknowledge who, who have been with this program over the last number of years who have, who, who have been wonderful. Uh, first is Professor Doc Fomeron, who has a, a very distinguished history working with the United Nations, uh, both at an academic level as well as with, with, with various economic and social agencies. Um, and I know he's extraordinarily well loved by the students who, who have worked with them. So I just wanted to publicly acknowledge Professor Palmer. Um, and, I, and I also wanted to, 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 to acknowledge that the, the person who's probably been the, been the central um, actor in, in carrying forward the, the traditions of, of UN internships and UN academic program over the, the last nine years, and, and someone who's really performed just remarkable service. It's just, uh, first of all, an old-fashioned intellectual who, who I always will love to break bread with and, and drink wine with and discuss opera or, 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 or any other topic. Um, but it's also just had incredible dedication to Occidental, to DDA, but really much more than that, to the, the students of, of, of the UN program, uh, Ambassador John, John Hirsch. The students did want to make a, a brief presentation to you, um, if, if, if they possibly could, Master Hirsch. We just wanted to present these flowers. I hope you can all hear me without the microphone. Um, to both of you, um, and especially to Ambassador Hirsch, just for running the program for us, because we could not have done it without them. They are not only our professors, but they help place us in the internships and really help guide us throughout the semester in New York and at the UN. So a huge round of applause and thanks, and much appreciation to both of you.
ideas, and this grows from the, this history project, which I've just finished running after 11 years, are one of the main outputs and one of the main values of the United Nations. This first slide, I'm going to have a bad taste to quote ourselves, which you should never do. These are the last two sentences from the first book, the first of 17 books that we commissioned in the project. People matter and ideas matter. Why? Uh, and this really is the two parts of the project, one related to an art of history and one related to big ideas. Because the short of this is that institutions live and die by the quality of the ideas they come up with, and they also live and die, or thrive and, and, and shrivel, uh, by the quality of the people who work there. And there is an impression, I don't know how widespread amongst the people who are in your, your program, that this is a collection of, of uh, dour diplomats and boring bureaucrats. And it's a traveling circus, a talk shop that goes on and on, a little corruption mixed in. Now, there are elements of truth in this, and I, I, I think that one doesn't do a service by trying to deny that. But the story is much more complicated and much more complex, and I think, at the end of the day, positive. So I'm going to try to tell that story. I thought I'd take just a minute at the outset to talk a little about this project, which um, went on for 11 years. And because some of you may try to get involved in a research project, maybe not as complicated as this one. You need an advisory board, and advisory boards are sometimes um, told you sometimes just put them on your stationery. This advisory board actually consists of a group of people from around the world who actually did stuff. Uh, Margaret Ansey, for example, read all 17 books of drafts. Several of these people uh, commented on the manuscripts. Three of them actually contributed them. We also had to have a lot of money. Uh, I didn't want this to have a blue tinge to it, even though the slide has blue. Um, we were totally independent. And in order to do that, we got a substantial amount of money from seven foundations and, and eight governments. And to their credit, they allowed us free run. I've had my hand out for a long time, thank you, sir. And what was interesting this time is they finally saw the advantage of not just sound bites, but digging, which was going to take a significant amount of time. I'm also happy to report that as a result of this, the archives are in much better shape. But several institutions, uh, UNDP, our friend Craig Murphy, uh, did a, a major study, the ILO, UNESCO, um, have begun major looks at their history. Um, I am, obviously, the, the, these are the titles of 17 books, there's a little something for everyone. The point about these books is these are the footnotes, so to speak, for what I'm going to try to do this evening. These go from <laughs> how to measure to the development decades to women and gender, uh, human development, human security, the environment, global governance, human rights. As I say, these are the footnotes for what I'm going to try to say this evening. But I'm going to start with the power of people. The reason that I thought it was important is that too many students, too many faculty, um, have the impressions generated by websites, by op-eds, by textbooks, however brilliantly written, um, <laughs> And they don't feel and read it. They don't see the people who are there. And for me, in an age of kind of cynicism and nihilism, one of the reasons I tried to do this 80-person oral history was to breathe some life in it. These are real people who try to make a difference. And in fact, they did. Um, it's this book um, uses only about 1% or 2% or of uh, material I gathered over six years, and it's always too late to do an oral history. Just as we were getting started, Jan Tinbergen, the first Nobel uh, laureate in economics, and uh, Mahmoud al haq who started the human development work, died. And actually, since uh, these interviews have been completed, another 15 people have died. I, not because I interviewed them, but <laughs> subsequently. But there's an actuarial imperative of trying to get in touch with what's there. So, who are these people? Um, they're about half from the north, half from 
the South. Um, I pulled together this work in an electronic book. I've left some copies of the CD with Anthony, uh, which the UN Foundation actually gave us a lot of money to have. This was not cheap to put together, but it's a really good research tool. If you want to look up what uh, someone had to say about NGOs, you can find it. Or if you want to look up trade preferences across a number of people, you can find it. So half from the north, half from the south, about a quarter of them were refugees, interestingly enough. Actually, a quarter of them were women, which probably over-represents by far the early years when there were not very many of them around. And as I say, my purpose here was to really enliven this uh, work. It's not, as I say, a substitute for research. For every hour of interviews I did, I had graduate students probably doing 20 hours of research. Uh, and this was, in fact, a uh, one of the, 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 the most fun things I've done in my career. These 80 people go across the planet. They include all the secretaries general, obviously. Uh, the first black African who headed the UNDP office, George Sincero. <laughs> Uh, somebody like Cardoso, who was in exile and did his work on Dependencia and Eclair, and a whole series of other people. Um, as I said, one of the reasons that I did this is because, and this is what the Secretary General said when we launched this volume, it's essential that the UN continues its role as a powerhouse for ideas. We began this project because, for me, Human progress reflects ideas, and it was the proposition here was that this may have been the UN singular accomplishment. So, after this work, and you're going to see this slide again this evening, based on these oral histories, based on the books, we think it's really critical, and this will lead to the MDGs later in the talk, there are four reasons why big ideas matter, and little ideas matter. Uh, we saw this uh, in Tunisia and Egypt recently, but in the UN context, we think ideas are important because they change the way we talk about issues. It's really critical how you frame them. They help redefine priorities, how states and non-states decide what's important. They help setting agendas, so that's reason number two. Ideas help people mobilize in unusual coalitions, states, non-states, like-minded states, unlike-minded states, in ways that we haven't seen before. And finally, ideas get take an institutional form. They use the jargon to get embedded in institutions, and people and money are devoted to working for them. Well, I mean, what does this mean, actually, if you're not a political scientist working on this? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, if you're thinking about development, and what development means is bricks and mortar and GDP per capita, or you're thinking about human development and you're thinking about girls' education and freedom from uh, want in various ways and the quality of the environment, that's really a very different business. Or security, bombs and bullets versus empowerment of pe people. So it's very important which ideas you use. Setting agendas for action, um, particularly when ideas clash, which is a lot of the time. Um, something I've had a lot to do with recently in my research, the responsibility to protect. How do you put together the notion of a respect for state sovereignty and a respect for the most basic human right of life? Or what do you do with development? How, what do you mean by sustainable development? There's an imperative to grow. But there's also an imperative to so these ideas are important in terms of setting agendas. Obviously, this is a necessary but insufficient step. You only have to point to Darfur or Cancun to see that you need more than ideas, but it, it, it's a critical first step in our view. Third, coalitions. Uh, if you think about how the International Criminal Court was put together, if you think about the Landmines Treaty, if you think about the various women's conferences, this pulls together states and non-states in a way that was not possible before these ideas were put forward. And finally, as I said, ideas matter because institutions, governmental ones, intergovernmental ones, non-governmental ones, 
devote resources and people to them. I think the best term to use for this is there's an idea has clout once there's a critical mass. So if you look back to the history of the environment, uh, before 1972, there were virtually no ministries of the environment. There were very few <coughs> non-governmental institutions devoted to this. And the intergovernmental ones didn't have focuses anywhere in their bureaucracy on the environment. Similarly with peace building, after the messes of the 1990s, we now have a peace building commission, which is not the answer to all of our prayers, but it's an institutional representation that an idea and a problem need to take institutional form. During these oral histories, I'm just going to take a couple of people. Um, Stefan Hassel, who actually, you guys probably don't watch Francois Truffaut, but uh, there was a film called Jules et Jeanne, in which there was a, a uh, ménage à trois. Well, uh, <laughs> Stefan Hassel is the product of this, but he also was the ambassador in Geneva at the OECD in New York. And when we talk to him about the importance of ideas, you know, here's what he tells you. It is, the way people talk about these is critically important. And in his view, we need a strategy. We need a universal declaration. And it's important to carry forward hopes and potential. So that first idea, the first way ideas matter. The second way ideas matter, Nolene Hazer, um, <laughs> she and I, uh, traded stories about surviving the Jesuits. Uh, she was at UNIFEM and uh, is now the head of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. But Nolene talks about that second way, when, how, when the rubber hits the road, what happens? And in her experience with women's issues, she, she tells us that women pressured for the revisions of national norms, and so the, the way that international norms come in and are used and take legal form in a domestic context. So in her view, this is a critical component. The project doesn't just come up with good illustrations. Um, ideas can also be uh, nefarious in a couple of ways. Nafi Sadiq, uh, a Pakistani uh, pediatrician who ran the FDA for a long time, worked on women's reproductive rights, talks about, yeah, you can get coalitions together. Unfortunately, the coalition that got together uh, between the Vatican and Muslim countries tried to get in the way of taking steps forwards. And she tells a story about uh, having trouble getting into ladies' loo because of these coalitions. And similarly, in terms of institutions, Bayou Adadeji, who now runs an NGO in Nigeria, who headed the Economic Commission for Africa, was an academic, talks about institutions actually being a place where you can bury ideas. The ideas take on a life of their own and justify the unjustifiable, namely just the continuation of the institution. So let's try to keep those four ways in mind, pluses and minuses of all four. And before I go to the, uh, the ideas part, I'm just going to put up one quote which shows why I had such a good time doing this. Uh, Lourdes, who's on our advisory board, a Mexican anthropologist who was the deputy of UNESCO, <laughs> talks about... The United Nations, was, someone once said, was an, a, a, a dream managed by bureaucrats. She switches that around. I correct that by saying it's become a bureaucracy managed by dreamers. So this is like being in a government in which everyone's in, all the parties are in power at the same time. And so she concludes and says, someone who works there has to be a magician of ideas. So I want you to keep that image as well. Ideas. I have... Um, <coughs> In this book, uh, the one uh, which is the last book in the series, which tries to pull together the findings from the other 16, uh, which uh, Richard Jolly Louis and Murray and I, I did, it came out in 2009. It's important to keep in mind, uh, and I'm not going to obviously go through the, all these ideas, that our definition of the United Nations encompasses not just the member states, it encompasses that clearly, not just the international civil servants, the second UN, it also encompasses something we call the third UN, which is experts, commissioners, NGOs, individual academics who care about the issues and push to change them. It also is important that when we say UN ideas, we're, it, 
We're not arguing over who came up with these ideas. What we're saying is that the UN provided an important value added. Margaret Ansey gave us a, a alliterative framework. Uh, <laughs> she says, you know, sometimes it's a it's a fount. It's the source of the idea, but sometimes it's a fount, and it's just a baptismal ceremony in which you're approving ideas. Sometimes the UN finances it. Sometimes it, it there's a phone file and just sort of. Uh, publicizes it, and sometimes it's a place to bury it for the funeral. So the, the UN has various roles, and what we're saying is we're not arguing over, you know, who made the biggest contribution, we're just saying that the UN was critical. The world would be at quite a different place without the UN's role in these ideas. The middle portion of the book talks about nine big issues, which are there for you to look at. The one I want to play with this evening is the third one, that is, in our view, the setting of the development agenda, the setting of development ideas, has been a, a critical part of the contribution of what the UN has, has been done. Keep in mind that, in fact, all of these ideas change over time. Uh, we move on the human rights score from when the United States uh, had this black problem, the Soviets had the gulags, the Brits had the colonies. So we had an aspiration about human rights to a phase when I think we be much closer to implementation. And the notion of gender from sort of eliminating discrimination to empowerment. And a whole series of issues on international peace and security. So these ideas are not static. And certainly the, my presentation of why setting development goals are important is anything except static. To provide this historical context, you should sort of go back to the late 1940s. If you pick up a copy of Paul Samuelson's textbook, the first edition of his textbook, the best-selling economics textbook of all time, um, there's no mention of development. There's no mention of development economics. The notion at the time was that, and for some time, was that development in poor countries uh, was, you know, you just sort of do what you've done everywhere else in the Industrial Revolution, starting in Britain and the, the industrialized world. Little recognition of mass poverty, the legacy of colonialism, uh, population problems, health problems, lack of foreign exchange, you can go on and on. But, so there was a fight about, you know, what is development? How do you think about development? And this is where the UN comes in on, on, on the record. As we looked at goals set beginning in the 1950s with some UNESCO goals on education, we looked at 50 of these, um, the precursors to the Millennium Development Goals. We found that actually far more had been accomplished on these than everyone customarily thinks, that, you know, that these have all been disastrous uh, failures. In fact, I'd say that the glass, and I would argue the same thing for the, the uh, development of the Millennium Goals, is that it's about three quarters full. I mean, there are lots of problems, and the UN gets it better on the social side than on the economic side. They don't get it quite right on the... Uh, the A targets and the African development equations. And the other problem has been, in our view, that the bank and the fund have never bought into, or rarely bought into, these social goals. Let's just think about these goals, or a couple of them. We're obviously going to end up with the Millennium Development Goals. Some of these, eradicating malaria, we obviously uh, are still a long way from that, and Bill Gates and others are, are, are attacking that in some way. Universal primary education, when that goal was first set, it was about one-third of the planet. It's now, unfortunately, only three-quarters of school children, but still, that's a huge step forward. I think it, the story that I like to tell is really the, the smallpox story, because I think not because the, 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 the science is the same as anything else, but because I think the politics are really interesting and help us understand where we need to go with the Millennium Development Goals and uh, lots of other goals. 
if you think about smallpox, um, and here I think about a, 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 you know, a famous quote from Schopenhauer that says, true, first, uh, it's ridiculed, the idea you have. Second, people fight against it. And finally, it's self-evident. Why didn't we do that earlier? And I think the story of the smallpox, the idea that you could eradicate this disease that had been around for centuries, the blight of humanity, the first uh, director general they call it the World Health Organization proposed in 1953 that we do so. This, he was laughed out. Uh, the politics were wrong. In particular, the Soviet Union was totally dead set against this. We fast forward just a little bit, not 1953, but 1958. The Soviets had problems in the southern part of, their, of the then Soviet Union. Other people said, well, you know, maybe it's about time to do something. So the Soviets had made a proposal in 1958 to do it, something again. Unfortunately, the donors didn't put any money behind it. But in not too distant future, 1967, an effort was finally made and funded. It started with, you know, 30 countries where, where the disease was endemic. Vaccinations occurred. Within three years, one went from that to just intervening with flying teams of doctors when something broke out. And in, by 1975, there were actually only three countries with teeny percentages, India, Bangladesh, and Ethiopia. And then by 1977, the last case of the Ethiopian nomad was found in, in Somalia. And that was the end of the story. So my question is, this now saves several, I mean, if you, it, in today's dollars, if you thought about how much inoculation you would have to do. The, the, we're thinking about eight to ten billion dollars a year savings. The cost in today's dollars, uh, in 19, uh, the program from 67 to 77 was actually 300 million dollars. Uh, the cost of three fighter planes at that time. So the question is, could we apply any of this logic to our next task. The Millennium Development Goals, I mean, one of the things, uh, are summits anything more than a photo op? Well, obviously they're a photo op, but here are 150 princes and potentates and presidents and prime ministers that want to have their photos taken. The G20 gets together, it's the same thing. It is a photo op. There's no, you can't deny it's a photo op, but is there something else? You heard earlier in the week about these eight goals, the 18 targets. I'd like to make an argument that these are critically important in helping bureaucracies manage problems and taking steps forward. <coughs> if we go to that, well, there's supposed to be some more slides, it looks like the machine is frozen. Well, anyway. Um, if we go back to that slide of the four ideas, uh, four ways that ideas matter, and you think about these goals just briefly as to why uh, we should think creatively and use ideas. The first one, it's, if you think about number six, AIDS and the malaria and other diseases, the way this, the AIDS uh, epidemic has been reframed, including, by the way, the Security Council saying this is now a threat to international peace and security. You can argue about whether that's a sensible thing for the Security Council to do, but it does suggest that using an idea, and I've just come back from southern South Africa where, in fact, you would have to say that it's, it's a security threat when you see the statistics, um, but the, the way this idea is used is important in taking steps forwards. It's important in mobilizing money. I mentioned Bill Gates in the second part of the six, uh, malaria. Um, it's important in getting donors on the same page. That second way, redefining state and non-state interest, setting an agenda. If you look at com competing or sequencing questions on gender, child mortality, maternal health, when you talk to donors and you go into an aid ministry or you go into the World Bank, these ideas are really critically important 
in terms of getting people on the same page and trying to <coughs> agree on a sequence, agree on a priority, and put money where their mouths happen to be. I think that that third issue of NGOs, states, various kinds of states, secretariats coming together has been clear, not just in 2000, but in the monitoring exercises in 2005 and 2010 last September. Uh, it's important to pull, and I, I've been at, done a bunch of interviews with you and officials, these bureaucrats need gimmicks, they need a hook on which to report what they're doing. There has to be, you don't want to be embarrassed and say that we haven't tried to do something for girls' education or that we don't give a hoot about the environment. We're doing exactly what we were doing five years ago. So if you look at why institutions react and how they react, the, the kind of notion of mobilizing coalitions is critically important. And then finally, on that uh, final issue, which is the, uh, the institutional base itself, it's really important um, to uh, realize that over time, the, uh, the bank and the fund have not bought into the UN's social agenda until the Millennium Development Goals. The fund still hasn't, but the World Bank has come on board, and this has actually made a huge difference. Uh, in the slides that we don't have, um, I wanted to try to illustrate why uh, ideas matter. And if you look at the statistics, and we think about one big idea that there was a clash on between uh, the Bank of the Fund on the one hand and the UN on the other, namely the nature of structural adjustment. If you look at the statistics on growth, which was the only reason to have structural adjustment, that was the way structural adjustment was was sold, and you compare 1960 to 1980, uh, and you look at Latin America, the growth rate for that period was not terrific, but it was, it was still 80%. And if you look at the next 20 years, the heyday of the Washington consensus and structural adjustment, the rate was 9%, so the lost decades of development. And of course, in Africa, the situation is catastrophic only 35% in 20 years, but then a negative 15%. So an idea is critically, critically important. And so we, in our argument here, the summary is that, in fact, this is the UN singular contribution. Setting goals is one of the ways that this has happened. The balance sheet, we have pluses and minuses. And on the minus side, as I've done a lot of pluses, you, you certainly put a late reaction to the Washington Consensus. You certainly put the abysmal turnaround on AIDS and, and getting rid of Jonathan Mann and losing 15 years. And that You certainly put attention to gaps as being a shortcoming. I would certainly put uh, a whole series of other things, including the special needs of the poorest countries. But when we line up the, the pluses and the assets and the debt,